The two lessons that we have next uh, are our seventh commandments and a beautiful passage from Isaiah. And this is one of those passages that, you know, I think there's those things you should just always keep handy and keep around. This is one of them because it really almost doesn't matter what horrendous situation in which we can find ourselves. We have a promise from God that God will come and send the anointed one to put balm on our wounds and to heal us and to restore us. And so hear this in the middle of the Ten Commandments and the very exciting Seventh Commandment about adultery. It's a little vague, this commandment, so do pay attention. Exodus 20, verse 14. You shall not commit adultery. That's all. Isaiah chapter 61, verses 1 through 3. The Spirit of the Lord God is upon me. Because the Lord has anointed me, he has sent me to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and release to the prisoners, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn, to provide for those who mourn in Zion, to give them a garland instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the mantle of praise instead of a faint spirit. They will be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord to display his glory. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, you do anoint our wounds. You are a God of healing and hope. You are a God of power and glory. And you invite us to share that. Open your word for us this day. Be present in our lives. Be present in our hearts. Amen. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. And keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. The greatest commandment, love the Lord your God with all your heart. In Hebrew, all your lev. In our psalmistas group, sometimes we talk about the fact we find a word in the psalms that actually it's better just to use the Hebrew word because we can try and try and try to find an English translation and it pales in comparison to what the meaning in the Hebrew is. Lev, our heart, is one of those words. Lev has nothing to do with that muscle in our chest that goes lub dub, lub dub, lub dub, lub dub. It has nothing to do with our tortured, tangled, lonely, cheating, foolish, dragged around, hungry, achy, breaky hearts. Our lev, our heart, is the core of our being, our emotions, our courage, our thinking, our understanding, our wisdom, our judgment and our will, our planning and scheming, hoping and dreaming, it's the seat of our desires and the true measure of who each one of us is as a human being. Our lev, our heart, is where we make sense of all that is around us, but also within ourselves. Our lev, our heart, is the deepest expression of our innermost authentic God-created self the source of the kind of love that God wants. Love with everything that we are. So I ask you, how can we love like that? Because we are loved. The psalmist sings, great is your steadfast love toward us. And God made loving promises to us that are so much more like marriage vows. I pledge myself to you and entered into a covenant with you, says the Lord God. I will take you for my wife in steadfast love and in mercy. I will take you for my wife in faithfulness, and you shall know the Lord. God gives us these Ten Commandments and makes these promises to us and with us as people who have been freed. We are free to say no. But if we say yes, 
We promise to love God with all our lev, all our whole being, giving our lev, ourselves, to no other gods, treasuring the Lord's name and setting apart sacred time to be with our beloved. Our promises, all of our promises, create something new. They create something new in the world, and they create something new in our lives. And so when God, our creator, spoke the worlds into being, it was just not a spot on the map for us to exist. It was a sacred dwelling place in which we can live as God's people, loved, freed, and sustained by God's ongoing promises and God's ongoing acts of love. And both of those are given on our behalf so that we can live in faithfulness, to live in shalom, in all that that means. God, our creator, makes us creators, helpers, in God's loving, freeing, and sustaining work. The words of promise we speak to one another, all of our words of promise are part of that creative work. It's God-given work. When we make promises, we speak worlds into being. Our words of promise create a sacred space. Our words of covenant are the genesis of many creations, places of shalom. When I meet with couples before I marry them, I want them to know that their ceremony is so much more than a formality. The words of the service create a sacred space. It creates a sacred space for them to make sacred promises. That process, that separation of two people leaving behind what was and walking into what is, is important. Couples stand right here, and I stand with them with the nervous groom, and I tell them, you will never forget what she looks like coming down the aisle. And we stand there. And before we do anything, I ask them, do you want to do this? Do you come here freely to make this promise? They say yes. Then I ask them, do you have goodwill? Is it your intention to be faithful? And they say yes. Then I ask their families and their friends, do you make a promise to these two people to help them live into the promises they are about to make because we cannot do this alone? To live into those promises requires the love and care of the people around us. And surrounded by those promises, two people leave that behind. And they walk up here and they light these candles. That is the light of God that has been put in each one of those individuals, the sign of that love that created them. By the way, they're not the mother family candles. The families are down there. We're creating something new. Sorry, Mom. For me, these are the two individuals created by God and the light and love of those two individuals. And we stand here and we pray before we do this. And we ask God to be present. And we have created a sacred space surrounded by love and surrounded by promises and surrounded by the love of God for two people. It is one of the most intimate moments two people will ever share in public. The creation of something new. And they make these sacred promises to love one another and care for one another in times of sickness and trouble and sorrow. And when they do, those promises create something new. And they come... And there it is. Something never before seen something sacred, something unique, created by promise, creating a sacred space in which two people will live in shalom. That's the promise and hope of every wedding. Those words of promise create that new and unique and sacred space filled with light. And it creates bonds, but also boundaries 
in which they can live in faithful freedom, sharing our love, our heart, our very being, our innermost selves. And more than just the physical nearness of our bodies, we share intimate knowing. We speak the language of our bodies, sacred, wordless speech. And our body language, refracted through the prism of our hearts, becomes the language of our hearts. That is intimacy. And that's why the seventh commandment is about so much more than sex. Yes, I said it at 10 a.m. in the morning on the internet. <laughs> Loving God and no other, living into that first commandment, means living into the rest of them. And we cannot do it alone. God, our creator, also makes us creators and charges us with the care and the flourishing of God's people and charges us to live in shalom with one another, creating a community where we live without harming one another. The seventh commandment is about our hearts. It's about dividing our hearts. And when we divide our hearts, we turn a blessing, the blessing of our sexuality, into something destructive. And it's no less sacred than the sixth commandment. God is saying that the marriage and family of my neighbor is worthy of as much protection as her life. And it's not only about my marriage, the sacred, spacious shalom that I create with my spouse in words of promise. It's about my neighbor's marriage, the sacred space of shalom that he created with his spouse with words of promise. It's about adulterating the shalom of our many creations, of our relationships, and tearing at the threads of promise that weave and bind us all. It's not for nothing that Jeremiah described worshiping other gods as adultery. God wants nothing less than our undivided hearts, hearts that are totally devoted. But that devotion is not total if we treat it, other commandments as less than sacred. We are not loving God with all our hearts, all our being, unless we are caring for the well-being, for the sacred creations of our neighbor with all our being and all our heart. Jesus said to us, where your treasure is, there your heart shall be also. What do we treasure? I think we can confess before one another that more often than we would like, we do become divided. Our hearts become divided. And every day, in great and small ways, our hearts stumble. And we become stumbling blocks for the hearts of all the people around us. Our hearts can be cruel and selfish and fickle and corrupt and our hearts love with strings attached. And too often our hearts are unavailable to the people who need our love. All kinds of things excite us. All kinds of things distract us. And our desires can divide our hearts. And this is not only about our bodily desires. The easiest example I can think of is our work. Our work can become an engrossing lover laying bare our fear, exposing our desire for praise and recognition and feeding our longing fantasies for security. And this is a lover all the more insidious because she hides behind a curtain of virtue. The seventh commandment is not some archaic antediluvian law repressing our freedom a window into God's heart and it is a way to care for our own all of us to one degree or another know what it is to have a divided heart and all of us know what it is to love someone with a divided heart and with our divided hearts we grieve the heart of God we grieve ourselves we wound ourselves we grieve one another and we wound one another 
But my friends, God does not leave us in that comfortless, wounded exile. Remember our treasure. Treasure the promise that the Lord who loves us suffers with all who suffer and bears the wounds inflicted by our divided hearts. And treasure the promise that that same Lord embodies an undivided heart and embodies love stronger than death, embodies love that will never end, embodies love that bears the face of God. Though the mountains be shaken and the hills removed, yet my unfailing love for you will not be shaken, nor my covenant of peace be removed, says the Lord, who has compassion on all of us. Treasure the promise that the Lord who made that binding promise keeps that promise. To bind our wounds, to bind up the brokenhearted, to release the hearts that are held captive by desire or grief, and to offer healing, binding up our divided hearts. And my friends, the great challenge is God calls us to embody that same binding promise for all the divided hearts around us. Let us pray. God, is your st great steadfast love toward us, teach us your way that we might walk in your faithfulness. Give us an undivided heart that we might be your treasure, treasure you, and treasure one another. Amen. Amen.